Hello everybody, this is Fernando for the latest Aliens and UFOs video. Alright, let's go ahead and let's continue the wonderful book UFO Sightings by Alan Baker. Once again, focusing on the last chapter, chapter 12, the theme being conclusion. And in this case, it's part 3 associated with this chapter. We're almost done, folks. Maybe about... Two more parts, and then that's it. That'll wrap up this book here, and then I'll start focusing on another new alien or UFO type book. I'm excited. I can't wait to see what the next one will contain. It'll probably be something involving lots of interesting examples associated with the UFO phenomenon. I'm more interested in stories, people's encounters, rather than anything else. So without further ado, let's go ahead and let's start part three here. And in this case, it'll continue this next part associated with they are not UFOs or they are not aliens. Again, it's taking the theme that it's going to be something about hoaxes or other type of stuff. So this is what it says. We must now turn to the frequency of close encounters over the years since the late 1940s. For if we look carefully enough, we will perceive yet another enigma that weighs against the ETH as an explanation for UFOs. When Jacques Vallée examined the first catalog of close encounters immediately uh, within the vicinity of witnesses, he reports that reports to be compelled in 1969, he noted that the total number of entries was more than 900. More recent estimates suggest that the number has grown to about 5,000. This number, however, is almost certainly inaccurate by a factor of 10. As Valet reminds us in Revelations, only about 1 in 10 close encounters are ever reported, so the true figure is probably more like 50,000 encounters. Since the vast majority of these reports originate in the USA, Europe, and Australia, and since it is extremely probable that UFOs are a worldwide phenomenon, we can conservatively multiply this number by 2 to arrive at 100,000 close encounters. Valet discovered that the geographic distribution of close encounters indicates a pattern of avoidance of population centers with a higher relative incidence of landings in deserts and in areas without dwellings. Since the sparsely inhabited areas of the earth vastly outnumber the densely inhabited areas, he suggests multiplying the number of encounters by 10, giving a figure of 1. 1 million landings. In other words, if human witnesses were equally distributed over the surface of the land, and if they reported every close encounter they observed, the data universe should contain 1 million records. However, even this vast number does not give a true picture of the frequency of UFO landings. Data from a number of researchers suggests that sightings reach a peak at about 9 p.m. and then fall off after midnight before reaching a lower secondary peak at about 3 a.m. Since the vast majority of people go to bed at night and are thus in no position to observe the phenomenon, it follows that the number of reports would rise dramatically if people were constantly vigilant. Valet discovered that if that were the case, reports would rise continuously throughout the night and would peak at about 3 a.m. The actual reported events would thus increase by approximately a factor of 14. In other words, we have a total estimate of 14 million landings in 40 years if we strictly adhere to the ETH. Even if a culture was so technologically advanced as to enjoy unlimited resources, there would surely be no possible benefit to be gained by landing on a planet uh, 14 million times. A civilization capable of exploring interstellar space would certainly be past masters uh, with regards to the science of planetary survey. With our technology as it stands today, we can gather a colossal amount of information about a planet by placing satellites in orbit around it, and we can only speculate as to the remote sensing technology that would be used by advanced aliens. Although it can fairly be conceded that several landings might be necessary for the physical collection of various samples of flora, fauna, and minerals, any explorers who needed to do it 14 million times would surely not be worthy of the name. In spite of these arguments against the ETH, there remains no logical justification for claiming that extraterrestrials have never visited the Earth in the past. Likewise, it may well be that explorers from another planet 
have accounted for some close encounters over the years. The unusual features discovered on Mars and the Moon at least imply an ancient extraterrestrial presence, even if we will have to wait some years before this is either proved or disproved. Encounters such as those reported at Valensol and Rendlesham Forest, both of which were discussed earlier, would seem to point to technological activity in view of the measurable traces left behind. As we noted in the previous section, practicable interstellar travel is fantastically difficult, at least for 20th century human beings. The obstacles may be so great that they can never be overcome by any civilization anywhere in the universe. On the other hand, if there is an easy way, as yet undiscovered by us, to achieve faster than light travel, then nothing could be more natural than for alien explorers to survey our world. However, it seems less likely that if they are doing it now, they account for a vanishingly small percentage of those 14 million UFO events. But what about the rest? What could account for all the encounters that resist identification in purely mundane terms? The answers may lie in realms that are at least as strange as a hypothetical alien planet. Next segment is called UFO and Near-Death Experiences. If we turn away from the extraterrestrial hypothesis to account for the majority of UFO and alien encounters, a vast and fertile theoretical landscape opens up before us. Fed by mysterious rivers originating in the human unconscious and the wider universe, with which it is intimately and eternally linked. The fundamental characteristics of alien abductions have been compared with the phenomenon of near-death experiences, or NDEs. And although many aspects of the NDE differ radically from abduction accounts, there does seem to be a paradoxical connection. They are, in a manner speaking, opposite sides of the same metaphysical coin. The NDE can be divided by two basic types— so-called deathbed visions and out-of-body experiences resulting from serious injury or the immediate threat of death. In the huge number of cases studied, the participants report that their experiences were incredibly real and totally objective. Interestingly, although skeptics have suggested that such visions are the result of random neural activity in the dying oxygen-starved brain, there is evidence to suggest that NDEs are more likely to occur if the participant's consciousness is unimpaired. It is worth devoting some space to a description of what occurs during a typical NDE and comparing it to the basic elements of the abduction experience. Dr. Kenneth Ring, professor of psychology at the University of Connecticut, has probably contributed more than any other researcher to our understanding of what happens during these experiences. In his 1992 book, The Omega Project, Near-Death Experiences, UFO Encounters, and Mind at Large, he provides a useful, a useful comparison between the two basic scenarios. Many of their aspects are diametrically opposed. For instance, the initial reaction to an NDE is one of peace, tranquility, and security, whereas the UFO abductee feels confusion and abject terror. The NDE participant feels that he or she is experiencing something absolutely real, is surrounded by beings of light and deceased friends and relatives, and is encouraged to evaluate his or her life by a compassionate spiritual presence. The abductee senses a dreamlike quality to the experience and yet is forced to submit to a grossly physical examination by dreadful looking creatures who are following some obscure and sinister agenda. The NDE experiencer wants to remain in the other world, although he or she is gently persuaded to return home, usually with the admonition that it is not yet the right time to stay, and complies with feelings of disappointment, even resentment, but also intense happiness. The abductee, on the other hand, is unceremoniously dumped back on earth with attendant feelings of relief, confusion, and hatred of the kidnappers. The memory of an NDE is usually unimpaired and is accompanied by strong feelings of a profound spiritual component to the universe, 
together with the desire to live a life that is useful and essentially good. Abductees usually, although not always, require the assistance of a hypnotherapist to access the memories of their experience and frequently suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder. Finally, an NDE usually occurs only once in a person's life, most commonly in adulthood, whereas abductions can occur many times and usually begin in childhood. And with that, let's go ahead and let's pause it here, and then that way we can talk about these interesting aspects. So in this case, the other segment was concluding with regards to um, alien or slash UFO landings. It went through a really unique multiplication, I must admit. I don't know if I believe it 100%, but if you go by what they're stating, um, they do make one good mark. Why is it that these UFO landings always happen in the middle of nowhere? Like, why isn't it in the middle of Austin? Why isn't it in the middle of Washington, D.C., right? Or why not the mother of all places, New York City? Why is it always in, like, Bernie, Texas, the middle of nowhere, where nobody's going to see it? Like, it just doesn't make too much sense. Plus, the other argument is, if they're observing us and they have out of this world, no pun intended, technology, then why do they have to land? Why aren't they just observing us from a far off place, kind of like we do when it comes to other planets? So those are interesting. But as far as the calculation of up to 14 million landings in 40 years, I don't know about that. That seems a little far fetched. But I did like reading that apparently the most common time periods are at 9 p.m. to midnight, and then once again at 3 a.m. So those of you that are UFO hunting, write that down. You want to go between the hours of 9 p.m. and midnight, and then take a little break, and then once again go at 3 a.m. Now, the other one involving near-death experiences, that's new. That's the first time I've heard about a link associated with that and alien encounters. It'll be interesting to see how the rest of this chapter or this subject matter plays out but the idea is that they're both opposites of each other like you have near-death experience being almost angelic and then it's going to a place that you don't want to leave and then you have ufo abductions being the opposite happening in places that seem like hell and you want to scramble out of there as much as possible but you have no choice but interesting stuff. I'm, I'm gonna. I want to see what it plays out afterward. All right, everybody. Thanks again as always. Take care. Bye.